Welcome to uh, this uh, special programme today, uh, Revelation TV presents, as we celebrate Israel approaching her 70th anniversary as a nation reborn. Um, and my guest for this programme today is uh, Stephen Jaffe, co-chair of Northern Ireland Friends of Israel, and uh, Michael McCann, Israel Britain Alliance. So it's, it's good to see you again. I know we called it two programmes together <laughs> yesterday, but it's great to see you again. We also let you know that we are live, we are interactive, so we'd love your views and your comments. So the question I'm going to pose today is, what does Israel mean to you now she's approaching her 70th anniversary as a nation reborn? Um, I'll start off with, um, with you, Stephen, uh, <coughs> primarily because today is a special day in, uh, in Israel and, uh, and for the Jewish people worldwide. It's uh, Yom HaShoah. Can you tell us um, the build-up before next week? where we have the climax, which is Yom Hatzmut, which is Israel's um, Independence Day. So this period of the year, Simon, is called, uh, many people call it the Yoms. Yom is a Hebrew word meaning a day. And t uh, tonight in Israel, uh, they're commemorating the Holocaust in Yom HaShoah. Uh, tomorrow the sirens will sound and there will be a, a silence uh, very universally kept by the Israeli people to commemorate the six million dead of the Holocaust. Uh, the next Yom is Yom HaZikaron, which commemorates the fall in Israel's fall in, in all its wars and those who have uh, been victims of terrorism. And from that, we go immediately into Yom HaTzmut, which is celebrating Israel's Independence Day, obviously this year with a very special anniversary. And then the whole series of anniversaries uh, is completed with Yom Yerushalayim, which is uh, commemorating the reunification of Jerusalem. So, so from a very dire and tragic uh, commemoration of the Holocaust, through to remembering Israel's uh, dead in, in wars, through to celebrating its independence and then Jerusalem Day. Uh, these are very important anniversaries all in this time of year in the Jewish calendar. And also, can you explain to our viewers as well, because uh, there, are, there are many events being organised to celebrate Israel's 70th uh, birthday um, that fall around the 14th of May. Uh, can you explain the difference between uh, the Hebrew calendar and the Georgian calendar? So the Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar rather than a solar calendar. So that means that our festivals and our anniversaries can be at different times in the year. It could be sometimes uh, maybe four weeks uh, apart from uh, the uh, solar and the uh, secular calendar. Uh, so this year it happens that Yom HaTzmut, Israel's Independence Day, is about, uh, it's in the middle of April, April the 19th around then, whereas uh, in the solar calendar obviously it's, it's in May. So this year Yom HaTzmut is uh, being celebrated according to the Jewish calendar a bit earlier than the, the secular anniversary. Excellent. Thank you. Brilliant explanation there. Thank you, uh, Stephen. And uh, Michael, you have now, for a couple of years now, been working very successfully with the uh, Israel-Britain Alliance and uh, reshaping the political map uh, on behalf of Israel. And, um, you know, in Hebrew, kolakavod to, to the work you're doing. Um, but what does Israel mean to you as she approaches her 70th anniversary as a nation? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for not asking me to explain the difference <laughs> in, the, uh, in the calendars, uh, and we left it in Stephen's capable hands. Um, what it means to me, aside from the, the obvious Judeo-Christian links, um, uh, are two things. One, the overwhelming odds that Israel has overcome to, sur to survive as a nation, uh, going back to the declaration in May 1948, uh, the a war that took place, the War of Independence that took place immediately afterwards, and then you look at 1967 and the forces that were assembled in Israel's borders to attack, and then 1973, the Yom Kippur War, and then all the terrorist acts that have taken place, the First Intifada, Second Intifada, all of that stuff and how it, it has been overcome is nothing short of miraculous. But one of the things that uh, I look in awe at Israel about is what it's given our world. Uh, because I've been very lucky in life, I've been to places in India, uh, and I've seen drip irrigation invented by Israel. And then you look at some of the innovations that are taking place just now. I was reading an article before this evening's show. It was about neuroscientists working in Israel. They're mapping out the brain in order they can identify parts of the brain where they can get potential cures for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's. Yeah, I know many families will be watching the programme this evening who, uh, like mine, have had Parkinson's sufferers, people who have al Alzheimer's. Israeli scientists are now looking for ways in which they can map out the human brain, identify the part of the brain which is responsible for those illnesses, those diseases, and curing them. And when you think of 
the tremendous advances that have been made in, uh, in, in terms of medical science, in terms of uh, the contribution that Israel has made in so many different parts of our lives. We should be eternally grateful for it. And quite frankly, um, I just don't understand why there just isn't a universal feeling across the globe that we should just say a simple word to Israel, which is thanks. Absolutely. No, completely, completely. And um, uh, Stephen, what does Israel mean to you? Well, it means many things, Simon, very fundamental things in terms of my faith and my identity as, as a Jew. But if I'm going to pick one thing for the purpose of this programme, I'm going to say for every Jew in the world, Israel means security. Mm. We went from a position of powerlessness as a people, subject to horrendous persecution. We've mentioned the Holocaust being commemorated uh, this evening. From that absolute abyss to there being one part of the globe, one part of this planet where the Jewish people can call home and where we can defend ourselves as a people. Uh, that is a, a revolution in, in the Jewish people's history. Uh, it's something which is, uh, I think, for Jews in Israel, Jews around the world, it is hugely important that we know that there is this one place where Jews are responsible for each other in terms of protecting and securing them uh, both physically and in terms of the, the, you know, the Jewish uh, spirituality and that, that Israel is that center. Uh, it's made a huge, huge difference. So that's what Israel means to me. Fantastic. So let's have a look at this uh, very short uh, video presentation that looks at some of the wonderful achievements that uh, Israel has achieved over her short uh, 70 years as a nation uh, reborn. אנו מכריזים בזאת על הקמת מדינה יהודית. We have been through some difficult times. To bring an end to war. But I'm a second and lahore. Israel and Jordan make peace. She was shocked at Pre-therapy to be effective. Omri Caspi. Let's go. Extraordinary, isn't it? So we have to ask you the very important question, what does uh, Israel mean to you? So I'd love to know your views and comments. Please feel free to email or text into the programme. Uh, Michael, just seeing that uh, very short presentation of some of the major 
breakthroughs that Israel's achieved in uh, science and innovation, but also some of the incredible historic events that have occurred in that short time. Um, you know, Israel's nothing but, but a miracle, particularly if you compare the region uh, in which Israel lives in. It's uh, even more astonishing, isn't it? Well, when you consider the, the geography of the area and you, and you look at the basket, if you like, of Israel uh, along the, the, the southeastern coast of the Mediterranean, it's actually, if Israel didn't exist, the whole thing would collapse because all around it is mayhem and destruction and carnage. And you have this beacon of light, uh, the only democracy in the Middle East, uh, which is shining out. And, you know, you get this extraordinary thing in this crazy world in which we live, uh, which I have more views about why it happens, about people who want to... Um, in some way uh, denigrate this fine country, you know, boycott, divestment, sanctions. The irony is um, that all of the people that want that will be sitting with their mobile phones, they'll be sitting with their computers and their laptops and their desktops and every sort of technology, and all that proprietary technology comes from Israel. Uh, so they can look forward to going back to the Stone Ages while the rest of us will continue <laughs> in the 21st century uh, using these fantastic um, scientific innovations that come from great Israeli minds. Absolutely. So if we, uh, if we go back 70 years to uh, that very famous uh, Israeli cabinet that was made up of the likes of uh, uh, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's um, first prime minister, as well as, the, as his foreign secretary, Moshe Sharet, um, and also we know that, uh, you know, I think um, Itzhak Rabin was one of the uh, high-ranking Israeli soldiers, Shimon Peres, um, and to name but a few, of course, Mushi Dayan as well, to name but a few. Um, it was pretty touch and go, wasn't it, back in the uh, in '48, whether uh, David Ben Gurion would declare uh, an independent Jewish state? Well, absolutely. The pressure of the international community. Don't forget, there was uh, the Arab armies who were prepared to bear down on this new state the very day that it was going to be uh, established. Uh, many people, many uh, military experts saying Israel doesn't have a chance, you know, that, that they can de declare independence one day and be driven into the sea the next. So those tremendous pressures on the Jewish leadership in uh, what was to become Israel uh, was huge at the time. And uh, we obviously <coughs> we view history with hindsight and we know that this country survived that war and went on to thrive, as Michael has been uh, reminding us of. Uh, but actually, in those very early days, it was very touch and go whether Israel could hold out with, uh, was it five invading armies uh, at that time, just ready to poise to, to attack the state the very day that it was declared? Right, we've got a few uh, emails and text messages, so thank you for sending them into the programme. Uh, this is from Judith, who writes, uh, Before watching Christian television, I knew nothing about Israel. Now I have a passion for Israel, and I'm delighted to say that I've been involved in a very small way in those making Aliyah. I heard someone on Revelation TV say that it would be very upsetting for a Jew to see you wearing a cross. I wear my Star of David with pride, and that's from Judith. Um, this is from our good friend, you know, uh, Robin Benson. Yeah. Um, there you go, fellow countryman. Uh, and uh, Robin says, uh, hi, Simon and guests. Great show. Well done. Uh, thank you for taking the time to highlight the 70 miraculous years of the existence of Israel as a modern state. And its very existence is a miracle. Clear evidence that the God of the Bible keeps his promises and still watches over his land and his people. Uh, a variable and thriving democracy that literally blesses the rest of humanity on a weekly basis with new medical and technological breakthroughs. I am Israel High. The people of Israel live. And that's from Robin. So great contribution, Robin. Well done. Uh, I'll just read out one more. This one says, uh, Israel is hope. God has set Israel... Uh, as a light for all the nations. There was no such more, but many is all hope. They have done so much for the world. God bless. And that's from Glenda in West Yorkshire. So thank you very much for Glenda. We've got a few more coming in. Um, but if you consider that, uh, you know, the, the, the British um, have a lot to answer for, don't they, uh, during that period of time, particularly, sadly, the uh, Atlee's government and uh, Bevin in particular by putting... Um, blockades on Holocaust survivors coming to Israel where uh, the Jewish people who survived the horrors and evil of, uh, of the Nazi uh, regime across Europe where six million precious Jewish lives were murdered at the hands of the Nazis and we have a British government then uh, preventing Jewish refugees from entering into the land and also then helped to supply the Jordanians and others with weapons against this newly formed Jewish state. Well, you know, something that's, this has always been something that, that's troubled me when I've read that that period of history where 
um, you know, British soldiers. And, uh, and the, when I was a politician, uh, there was a, the, one of the, the guys that I was routinely involved with uh, for Remembrance Day and other events, Armed Forces Day and other events like that, uh, was one of the first liberators in Belson. And he tells me the story and, you know, and it, even after the lapse of time, the, the heartbreak in his voice and what he's seen in that day is, is truly horrific. And then when you consider, uh, you know, Americans liberated camps, British liberated camp, the Russians liberated uh, out switching, you consider all those things. And then after the war, when people were starting to mend, very slowly but starting to mend, we had a situation where Britain, who was previous, in, in the Labour Party, Britain was, uh, was the most Zionist party in Britain of any of the parties. And then suddenly, the Attlee government, uh, having given freedom to uh, India and all different parts of the, the world which had been previously been called British colonies, part of the empire, suddenly took this unbelievable decision where they put the people who had who just been liberated from camps into other camps. I mean, uh, you know, it's one of the, the, the great shames of the, the Attlee government, and he'd done an awful lot. You know, the town that I, that, that, that I, was, uh, uh, I was brought up in, East Kilbride, one of the first new towns in 1946, New Town Act created, uh, that gave me the opportunity to grow up in a fantastic environment with my mum and dad and my, and my siblings. But that has to go down in history as one of the great calumnies of the Attlee government that they did that to the Jewish people after the Second World War. And um, Stephen, uh, you know, it's a little story I was just telling you just before we uh, went on air. Um, the fact that on the 12th of May, the Jewish Leadership Council met in Tel Aviv to discuss what they should name the state. And uh, according to my notes here, um, some of the na name they were going to call it Zion, uh, uh, Sabra, uh, and the other suggestion was Judea. But uh, they rejected Judea primarily because it didn't fit within the uh, 1947 partition plan. Uh, and there was a vote, and it won seven votes to three, and they called it Israel. Um, what does that really show about uh, the leadership of, of David Ben-Gurion, that he, he actually risked the, of incurring the wrath of the Americans by declaring independence? He knew that by declaring independence, Israel would then be invaded by five Arab armies. Um, he must have had a lot of hope in the God of Israel, that's all I can say. Well, totally. Uh, it's a, Israel is a country where it relies on miracles. I think that is, that is very true. And you just have to look at the map and you see Israel being, what, half of 1% of the Middle East. It's a population of uh, 8 million surrounded by much bigger countries uh, to this day. Israel's survival is a miracle and I can't even begin to put myself in the minds of those people back in 1948 at that time of declaring independence, realizing that having suffered the Holocaust as a people only three years before, they were facing another Holocaust because the, the war aims of those Arab armies were to drive them from the land into the sea. That was what they were faced with. And to have the bravery and the audacity to declare independence uh, with that uh, on its way uh, is nothing short of, of amazing. Absolutely, and I, I want to pay a tribute to a, a very courageous British soldier that I interviewed um, uh, for this channel, Revelation TV, uh, Derek Bowden, who was um, a British paratrooper, um, did his time, served in Arnhem, um, but also fought in Israel's War of Independence. Um, what, what role did those uh, foreign fighters play, um, particularly those who had combat experience, to help I Israel defeat those five Arab armies back in? Well, they're called the Machal Volunteers, and they literally came from all over the world. Uh, just to mention one aspect of their contribution was that Israel didn't have an air force in, in 1948. I mean, just how basic uh, what they lacked in, in terms of, of a basic means of defending themselves. So they, they managed to get planes from all sorts of uh, vintage, not the cutting edge planes, but they didn't have anyone to fly them. And the, the people who came uh, to volunteer were in many cases, and it includes a, a, an uncle of mine who was one of these Michal volunteers who'd served in the RAF during the, the Second World War. So he had flying experience and combat experience. Uh, without that, Israel had very little. So they, they made a crucial uh, contribution in, in, that, uh, in that war of, of survival uh, when Israel declared its independence 70 years ago. 
Let's uh, remind ourselves what happened over 70 years ago uh, when uh, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first Prime Minister, declared an independent Jewish state of Israel. The British flag was lowered and in its place for the very first time flew the blue and white Israeli flag. Thirty years of the British mandate ended. Neither the jubilation nor circles of dancers in the big cities could conceal the fear and apprehension about what would happen the day after. The war of independence had begun. And we know Israel won that war, and that's why she's still there. 70 years later. I uh, just got a few more text messages. Uh, this one says, uh, Evening Simon and guests, Israel means for me, spiritually, if it was not for Israel and the Jewish people, I would not have a saviour or be adopted in God's uh, centre of his eye. Physically, as an incomplete uh, quadrupedic, much of my equipment and medical treatments uh, were first developed in Israel. Oh. Uh, because of Israel, I can send you this message. Uh, thank you, Israel. Remember and pray for you daily. Uh, my blessings I give to you, Israel. And that's from Norma. So that's a lovely, wow. lovely message from Norma. Thank you for this one. This one says, quite simply put for me, I believe Israel shows me that he's real. Uh, God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit are one, as in real play onwards, Israel. God bless Israel and those who live there. And that's from Deb. So thank you for that one. Uh, this one says, what is the population of Israel? It's around eight, hey, nine really. million, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and this one says, as a gentle believer, a gentile believer, sorry, in Yeshua Hamashir, this is what Israel means to me. Uh, grafted in, stand, rooted, um, Adonai, Elohim, Lord of this land, all spelt in Israel going down. So, you know, I, I think for a lot of our viewers, um, uh, Michael, there is a profound um, realization that Israel is there because of because of the the promises God made to the prophets thousands of years ago, and, and so therefore what we're seeing in our time is the Bible come true uh, in our day uh, and the hand of God working in that nation to bring His people back from the four corners of the earth. Isn't it, isn't it quite incredible that Israel is a very young nation? has been able to absorb Jewish communities uh, from all over the world in a very successful multicultural model. Absolutely, and, uh, and that's why it's uh, so frustrating when you hear uh, people denigrating Israel when you consider that 20% of the population is Arab. Uh, they have the same freedoms, the same rights as anyone else. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we have to call a spade a shovel. Uh, I've been to Israel several times. I'm lucky enough I'm going to be going again in a couple of, a couple of weeks' time for a holiday. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to going back. Uh, but Israel ensures, the government ensures, the people ensure that what, regardless of your faith, you can praise and worship in whichever way is important to you. And uh, it's all, I'm always taken aback by the fact that when you go into Temple Mount, that uh, Jewish people cannot take their prayer books there. Uh, and that's to recognise that it's, it's deemed to be a holy place for another religion and that that would cause a friction. And then so the place where um, Jesus turned over the, the, uh, the money changers tables, uh, where the, the second temple and the first temple were built, uh, you know, is respected and people can go about their worship in whichever way they wish to. The real, uh, the diametric opposite position would be if the Jewish nation was not there and that Israel had not survived, 
I don't think there's any prospect that if, that if Israel was a was 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 a Muslim country, that uh, Christians and, and Jews would have the opportunity uh, to have that freedom, uh, because they certainly don't have that freedom in the, in the rest of the Middle East just now, because Christians are without a shadow or without persecuted, and we know that there's genocidal ambitions all around Israel from people to drive the Jews back into the seas, just as they wanted to do back in 1948. Yeah. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, you, you talked in the opening program, uh, part, opening part of the program, Stephen, about how that Israel provides a security. But what would um, I mean if you, we consider the, the historic time period? It was only three years since the end of World War Two, um, and obviously the world became known about the horrors of what happened there, with with over six million Jews dying at the hands of uh, of, the, of the Nazis. Um, three years from there until the modern state of Israel has formed. It must have given the Jewish people around the world such an incredible hope that here, after 2,000 years of uh, being expelled from your homeland, to actually come back as a nation. And what other nation um, has been around for over 2,000 years and come back to its ancient homeland? Well, it's unprecedented and I would challenge any secular viewer watching this programme or any secular historian to explain it. Uh, because it bucks uh, anything that uh, people might expect from a completely secular study of, of history. It is, I think, the story of faith and the, the strength of faith. That hope, uh, the national anthem of Israel is Hatikva, the hope, uh, never left the Jewish people. I think of my grandfather, who was born in Eastern Europe, in, in uh, near Riga. He prayed to Jerusalem, towards Jerusalem, three times a day. His prayer was for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. That's a prayer that the Jews had, had, had been praying to God for, for two millennia. And I've seen it. I've witnessed it. I've been and you've been and we've Similar. seen a rebuilt uh, Jerusalem. For him, it was a, a prayer and an aspiration which he must have struggled to have seen how it could be. And yet we are so fortunate enough that we can mm. go on the easy jet on the Ryanair flight and, uh, you know, we're in Tel Aviv in five hours and we take the bus up to Jerusalem and we should never take that for granted, that we are witnessing something in our generation that for previous generations was, was, a, was a prayer and a hope and we've seen its realisation. Absolutely. Got a few more uh, emails in, so thank you for sending these in. This one says, uh, my father was one of the British soldiers who uh, had orders to turn back the exodus. Uh, he could not understand why as the Jews had been through so much. Uh, he's not with us anymore. Uh, fortunately, he wrote about it in a letter uh, describing World War II. Uh, we as a nation ought to ask for forgiveness. Uh, and that's Glenda, completely agree. And I'd love to be able to have a photocopy of his, uh, of his letter and his accounts, uh, Glenda. Um, this one says, um, Simon, myself and friends in Ireland, Pray for Israel and Jews every day. God bless you all. And that's from Joan. So again, the question is, uh, what does Israel mean to you? Now, considering um, Israel's short history, uh, you know, uh, the, um, the US State Department, um, I think the CIA, uh, the American um, editorial intelligent assessment at the time of Israel's War of Independence uh, gave Israel one week. And that's all they thought they could survive. And yet Israel's here 70 years later, face five major wars for, um, for her survival. And yet Israel's not going anywhere. And Israel is the most stable nation in the Middle East. And only those Arab states have actually had a peace treaty with Israel. Um, are actually stable, such as Jordan and Egypt. What does it mean today, uh, Michael, when we see the likes of the Saudis and the Saudi prince only, uh, only a couple of weeks ago saying he recognises Israel's right to exist and is opening up uh, Saudi airspace to Israeli aircraft. Um, isn't that something new and, and exciting that's going on in the region? As uh, a recognition of uh, that Israel's going nowhere? Well, I, th I think uh, you're absolutely right, but remember it wasn't just the US military experts that, yeah. uh, that thought that Israel was going to get wiped out before it had done anything. It was uh, British military experts and experts across, across the globe thought that Israel was going to be a very short lifespan indeed, uh, and they were all proved wrong. Uh, and let's not forget that there wasn't a peace agreement, sadly, uh, after the 48 war. It was an armistice, which meant that the, the tensions and the hostility increased. And it's important to remember that all the stuff that we hear about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict today, I, I think it should more properly be called the Israeli-Arab conflict, because, um, you know, arguably, if you were 
a Jewish person living in the Palestinian mandate, you've just as, right, as much right to call yourself a Palestinian as anyone else. But let's leave that uh, to the one side. It's all based on this fallacy that peace wasn't offered. There wasn't an opportunity to not have no fighting at all and for people to live in peace because the partition offered two states in 1947. Uh, only one uh, people had the vision uh, to say yes, even though they didn't say yes unanimously. There were still people who, including people like uh, uh, Menach and Begin, who, who didn't think that the settlement was the correct one, but they bit the bullet, if you pardon the, the expression, and they moved on and Israel became uh, a great nation. And I think um, the modern day reality that we see in the 21st century is that we see this the schism that's always been there in Islam between the Shias and the Sunnis, where you've got the, South, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia who are now uh, not only open up their airspace, but actually the, the, their main leader, uh, the young leader, this new young man that's come forward, has turned around and said that we must recognise that, uh, that Israel is a nation and can exist. So therefore, you know, that's a huge step forward. And, you know, I don't know, some people watching this programme will have strong views about, uh, you know, the partition agreement, uh, the two-state solution, all those things. People will have all their different views on that, and I don't think it's an appropriate place to get into that debate. But what everyone must hope for watching this programme is that, 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 and I'm sure Stephen does, is that what, what, what a great world it would be if we had, a, if we had some, some stability and peace in that, that part of our world. Israel doesn't want to spend 8% of its gross domestic, domestic product on uh, an arms, on its defence budget. It'd much rather spend it on its people and looking after them as any other nation in the world would want to do. So let's hope that this little chink of light that we see coming through uh, from the Sunni uh, Arabs looking differently uh, towards Israel, that it could perhaps, just perhaps, be something, uh, the start of something much, much bigger. Yeah. And um, Stephen, as we remember uh, Israel's 70th, and I think it's also important that we remember as well um, the over 700,000 uh, Jewish refugees, those Jewish communities that have been living um, in the Arab world since Bible times were forced to flee their homes in the Arab world, and uh, many of them came to Israel because uh, we know that the Palestinians have their own um, campaign, uh, you know, Nakba to remember the great so-called catastrophe, which was an, a failure of the Arab leaders. But how important is it that we remember the so-called forgotten Jewish refugees? Well, I think it's hugely important because it is so often written out of history. It's not a convenient narrative for those who take a, a hostile view about Israel. Uh, my wife is Iraqi. She's an Iraqi Jew. Uh, her father was born in, in Baghdad in, in the 1930s. Uh, there were well over 150,000 Jews in Iraq at that time. Today, there are fewer than 10. Uh, and that's true of many other uh, Arab states. Algeria had well over 100,000 Jews. Today, there isn't one. Uh, and this is true of Yemen and in Morocco, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, right across that North African and Middle Eastern uh, area the Jewish community was completely and utterly ethnically cleansed. Uh, many of them found uh, refuge in Israel and have, you know, went on to have uh, made a major contribution to Israel uh, today. So the Arabs really kicked themselves in the foot there because uh, they provided uh, Israel with uh, a, you know, a very significant element of its population. But it shows that the hatred that, uh, that there was for Israel and the Jewish people, that they were uh, you know, that they wanted to get rid of those Jewish communities and their ancient Jewish communities. As you mentioned, the Jewish community in Iraq dates itself from the destruction of the temple, and that's not the second temple, that's the first temple. So you're talking about a, a very ancient community indeed, which was completely eradicated. Absolutely. So uh, I've got this uh, email in that says, um, Israel is, it is home. Um, it, heaven being adopted into the family of God through uh, Jesus Christ, my Lord, a descendant of King David. And that's God bless Angela. So feel free to comment on uh, today's programme. That's the title. What does Israel mean to you? Feel free to send your emails and your text messages. Um, Michael, this is a, a good moment when we're, we're talking about the uh, forgotten Jewish refugees. I think it's also important to also remember that uh, Hamas uh, have a, a, a campaign uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and uh, the protests and demonstrations that we're seeing on Israel's border in Gaza right now are a means to raise um, and put 
Hamas's agenda and that of the Palestinians right up on in the international agenda, isn't it? So uh, we recorded a program yesterday on the Middle East Report discussing this, which will be aired next Friday. But can you explain to our viewers your latest campaign regarding this? Yeah. Well, can I just say from a historical context, it's really fascinating to look at the contrast between two peoples. Yep. Uh, the Jewish people, after the, the horrors of the Holocaust, uh, went back to their ancient homeland and started a new nation. A, a new nation was reborn, uh, in actual fact. And look at it now. Contrast that with the, with the Arabs who were in the Palestinian mandate, who, mandate who became victims, uh, self-inflicted victimhood. Uh, then you, the, the United Nations made huge mistakes in terms of creating refugee uh, status for them that is unique to them, where every year, rather than the number of refugees getting fewer, it increases. And now we've over five million refugees, some of whom, uh, or most of whom, had uh, went around. When you see the television pictures uh, uh, on the, from the from the violence in the Israel-Gaza border, you'll see young people throwing stones. They're in their twenties, they're, they're teenagers. They weren't around in 1948, yet they are designated as refugees. And the real issue that we have, Simon, is this continue, uh, continuing position of the Palestinians refusing to accept it. Uh, the peaceful negotiations, negotiations which are unfettered by any preconditions, they still go back and ask for things which are impossible to give. There is no prospect of those five million refugees going back uh, to live uh, in, in Israel, because it would completely change the whole state and would wipe Israel from the map and the, and the type of country it already is. In addition to that, there's still huge problems to, to deal with in terms of security and in terms of the final borders, if th those were ever going to be set and how a pe what a peace would look like. The problem is the Palestinians do not want peace and that's why they chant from the river to the sea, uh, we will be free. So that's, the, that's what they want. They want Israel wiped off the map. And what we're seeing in Gaza uh, today, and it will continue over the next four or five weeks, is more protests, more young people dying unnecessarily. So therefore, I would, if I can take the opportunity in the programme tonight, if you're sitting there, you're agreeing, hopefully, with what I'm saying, then please, if you don't have a computer, borrow one, go on www.israelbritain.org.uk and you can go to our website, you'll press on our current campaign, you can join up very, very easily, or indeed, or indeed, uh, just drop me an email and uh, I can talk you through all the details, very simple to join our campaign. Next week, Parliament goes back. We need to send them a message, our parliamentarians. We stand with Israel. It has got a right to defend its borders and its people in 2018, just as strongly as it had to do uh, when they faced the war in 1948. So please join up. We need every single person to do so. Absolutely. Thank you. Right, I just got a few more um uh, text messages and emails that come through. This one says, Simon won an amazing program. Uh, I was privileged to visit Israel with uh, Rev TV and meeting you last uh, December. After feeling strongly about going, the experience was out of this world and has transformed my uh, spiritual life. I find myself praying daily for Israel. Israel is a blessed nation and God has given us uh, samples of living uh, our lives through this nation. Israel is our foundation and guide through the scriptures. God bless you all. And that's Shalom from Naomi. Wonderful to hear from you, Naomi. And it was a, a fantastic trip. Uh, this one says, uh, Dear Simon and friends, thank you for the program. Uh, Israel means a great deal to me personally. It is my uh, spiritual home. And when I visit, I don't want to return to the UK. Know the feeling. Uh, God <laughs> gave me Israel. Uh, God gave Israel to the Jewish people as a blessing. And the Christians are grafted into the Jewish blessing and the love for the Jewish nation. So many things that are important to me about Israel. What a great uh, testimony of prophecy the renewed nation of Israel is, and such a great blessing to the world through their different innovations. Uh, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem and Israel a few times a week. Uh, many people live in Israel of different belief systems, but many are coming to know uh, Jesus as their saviour. And I believe the writings of the Holy Bible c concerning when Jesus comes back of all the inheritance of the land will be under his rule, not just modern small area, which is present Israel at the moment. So that's Dawn in Suffolk. So thank you for that one, Dawn. Um, 
I just kind of leading on and and saying that Israel means so much to so many people. Uh, you know, for for Christians, it's it's really seeing the fulfilment of God's word come true in a living state. And um, when you see the Bible come alive, how can you not love what God loves? And we know that God loves Israel. He loves the Jewish people. Um, uh, and so therefore that's our reaction. But for, for the Jewish people though, this Israel represents redemption. You know, after 2000 years of exile, coming back into your ancient homeland, but not only coming back to the homeland, but actually thriving in the homeland, that Israel is a light unto the nations. Um, so in terms of uh, culture and in terms of technology, how is Israel benefiting the world? No, oh, hugely. I mean, uh, Michael has already touched on medical uh, advances that Israel has produced. Uh, agriculture, you talked about drip ir irrigation, that's probably Israel's earliest and uh, in many ways most significant innovation. It's, it's, it's in the communications, it's in uh, people talk about the mobile phones, absolutely, the, the early technology for that, the, the microchips. Israel is a high-tech uh, power in the world today. It's a small country of 8 million people, but it has more com companies on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange, which is for uh, high-tech companies than any other country in the world apart from the United States and China. Think of that. Just look <coughs> in the map and the population. How can that be? Uh, but the contribution that they're making to us here in the UK, one in six medicines uh, dispensed by the NHS in this country uh, was uh, manufactured or developed in Israel. Phenomenal. Okay, and also um, what we're doing now is that um, to mark Israel's uh, 70th anniversary, uh, Revelation TV through uh, Tim Vince, who hosts uh, Bible, um, Bible Study, is going to be organising an event uh, for all of you um, to mark Israel's 70th anniversary. So let's have a look at this advert now. On the 9th of May at Westminster Central Hall, uh, you can join us for an amazing celebration. Revelation TV and friends, Tim Vince, Tunje Adebayo, Howard Conda, Gordon Petty, and some wonderful musical presentations. Howard has a brand new uh, presentation that he can show us. We'll be in the lecture hall at Central Hall, Westminster. You need to go on to Eventbrite, that's www.eventbrite.co.uk to book your tickets. You need to search for Israel Space 70 Christian Celebration and then you can book your tickets. They're only £12, there'll be limited spaces, but it'd be a wonderful time, a wonderful reunion, but also a celebration of the land that God gave to Israel and the life that he gives to all of us. And uh, Tim organised the fantastic uh, Balfour celebrations at Royal Albert Hall, so it's going to be a good event. Um, I have to, have to ask you, when we're discussing um, Israel and uh, Israel's innovation and um, Israel's culture, um, and, and yet what we're seeing really with uh, the US administration, uh, President Trump's administration, here we are, that um, the first um, president in, in America's history has recognised Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem. And to mark Israel's 70th anniversary, he's moving the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, you're probably more politically savvy than, than both of us put together here uh, with your time in, in Parliament. Is it possible for lovers of Israel and supporters of Israel to actually believe that we could change British foreign policy so that, that this government or a future British government recognises Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem? Because it's a fallacy at the moment. I mean, all, uh, sorry to interrupt, so, um, is that all Israel's government institutions are based in Jerusalem and not Tel Aviv. Isn't it time that the British Embassy moved to Jerusalem? Yeah, well, I've got a very simple view in politics, uh, which is that never been any doubt that a small group of committed citizens can make enormous change. And, uh, and if someone asks you the question, well, why? It's because that's the only thing that ever has made uh, any difference and made any changes. I think the... Uh, bear in mind that the decision to move the embassy, the Jerusalem Act, was passed some years ago but successive presidents haven't enacted it. Donald Trump was the only one that had the courage to do it. And I think it was the right thing to do because it recognised, first of all, the reality in the ground, as you've just pointed out, uh, Simon. All the institutions are in Jerusalem. So therefore, when I visited, when I was a politician in 2013, 2014, um, when we visited as part of the International Development uh, Committee and we were meeting government, government ministers, we were in Jerusalem. That's where we were meeting them. 
Um, and so therefore, uh, and, it, and it's for Israel to determine its own capital. Uh, we determine uh, in the UK and in England that it, our capital is London, the capital of Scotland Edinburgh, Belfast, uh, Cardiff, so on, and, so on and so forth. So therefore, uh, to suggest that a country can't name its own capital is complete nonsense. But you know something, there's a bigger political dimension as far as I'm concerned. Finally, someone has said it. Absolutely. It's a statement of the obvious. I think Theresa May was wrong to immediately come out and say, no, we're not going to do it and you know, con condemn the move that Donald Trump has made uh, because it needs something to shake up the status quo. We have got a situation in the Middle East uh, in terms of the, the Palestinian issue. They're getting vast sums of money for the United Nations. They continue to, to do very bad things, including uh, paying people salaries for committing crimes, even on the Israel-Gaza border, people have been offered, if anyone dies incidentally in the current conflict, Hamas will pay them $3,000 for a death, a serious injury will give you $500, and if you're lightly injured, you'll get $250. I mean, this is a madness. You know, normally you see things that if you're buying holiday insurance, and you, list, you, you read the things that if it happens, what compensation, and you're thinking to yourself, good, good, good goodness, I, I, I don't want to be... I don't want to be uh, you know, hurt in any way. I don't want any. I don't want any of that compensation. They're offering this as a tariff, as an incentive for people to get hurt. So therefore, I think the decision that Donald Trump has made is momentous. I think it will it will force people, and in particular the Palestinians, to realise that they have to wake up, smell the coffee, and realise that the only way they're going to be able to deal with countries like the the US, and I hope swiftly added to that will be the UK, is if they realise they have to talk peace. They have to stop celebrating and inciting violence, absolutely. stopping young people going to their deaths absolutely needlessly. Because one thing that I know that this chap beside me has is an abundance, is compassion. Compassion for anyone uh, on this planet who is facing uh, difficult uh, conditions. And we should all be compassionate for the Palestinians, simply be and, but we should hold in contempt the leaders. It's not the ordinary people that are causing the problem, it's the leaders. And they want they they should be blessed, and hopefully they will be blessed at some point in the future with someone who can lead them out of the darkness that they're currently in. Absolutely. So I'll just read out a few more text messages. Uh, this one says there is only one word to say what Israel means to the Protestant people of Northern Ireland: everything. And that's from Alex in Belfast. And uh, another wonderful uh, gentleman uh, called Ivor McClinton. Hello, Ivor. How are you? And I hope your wife are well. Uh, hosted me in Northern Ireland. Very, very lovely and delightful couple. Uh, it says, hi, Simon, Michael and Stephen. On this 70th birthday of Israel, uh, let's remember that Israel is one-sixth of the entire Middle East. Let's remember that the population in 1948 was 600,000 and today is close to 9 million. Uh, Israel has not only survived, Israel has thrived. That has happened because, it, because Israel is so important to God and if it's important to God, it has to be important to Christians. Israel. We have, as uh, Christians, wish you happy birthday uh, and say a huge thank you for the scriptures, for Yeshua, and for the fact that we have not uh, replaced uh, but are included in the olive tree. And he gives some um, scripture as well, which I'll read out. And this is from Deuteronomy 7, uh, verses 6 and 9. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people of his own possession. Out of all the peoples, uh, that are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath which he swore to your fathers, that the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage. From the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, know therefore that the Lord your God the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love is with those who love him and keep his commands to a thousand generations. And that's from Shalom from Iva and uh, B. And it's lovely to hear from you both. I, I know you're big friends of them as well. Absolutely. Uh, closing part of the programme, uh, we can't mention Israel's 70th anniversary and mention uh, not mention Israel without talking about how important and significant Israel is. So how will Israelis, and particularly those living in Jerusalem, be uh, marking Israel's 70th anniversary as a nation reborn? Well, I'm sure there are going to be lots of celebrations. The very traditional way that Israelis celebrate Yom Atzimut is with barbecues. Uh, that's, oh, yeah, yeah. that's very much part of the local, local scene. I'm sure this year there will be special uh, celebrations in the Knesset, uh, in, in, in all of Israel's main cities uh, with parades, 
uh, etc. But I think all countries celebrate their ind independence, Simon. One thing that Israel does, which is a bit special, is that it counts the years. You don't really hear about uh, you know, the number of years it is since other countries became independent. And I think that says something about the Israeli psyche. Uh, Israel is not to be taken for granted. Every year is to be celebrated and, uh, and as a blessing. And so I'm sure this year will be a very special celebration in Israel. Yeah, I think we're down to the last uh, two minutes of the programme, so we're almost coming to the end of the programme. Um, Michael, uh, you know, many of our viewers uh, have a love from Israel, from the scriptures, or having been to Israel, but can you explain why it's important that Israel needs uh, our, our actions, our, our, our letters, our, our, uh, to actually write to our political representatives to tell them about the righteousness of Israel's cause? Well, in the world in which we live, uh, we elect people to make decisions on our behalf. Uh, people offer their manifestos and we can decide who to vote for. That's a democracy uh, which sometimes we take for granted but we shouldn't. Uh, and we can make choices that way. And when we make those choices, uh, it shapes the future. And so therefore, uh, Israel is a democracy. That's the first link between us. We're both democracies. Some people occasionally say to me, uh, well, we don't need political campaigning because God will look after Israel. Yeah, but that's, tr that's true, but God also asks us to look after Israel. And in terms of uh, not only our spiritual support for Israel, but our practical, practical support, we can keep, if you don't mind me saying so, our politicians honest. We can, uh, we can alert them when their narratives or the information that they are giving out to people is incorrect. And we can ensure that in issues like the big one facing Israel today, and not, they face ex Israel faces existential threats every single day of the week. It's facing a big one at the border at the moment, and it needs our support. And we have to tell our politicians what we feel. And that's why political campaigning is necessary. Absolutely. And uh, Stephen, within uh, 20 seconds, um, can you explain why it's so important that our viewers stand up for Israel and the Jewish people? Well, I just want to recommend that people do support Michael and the Israel-Britain Alliance. He's made an offer this evening. He said, email me and I'll take you through the process <laughs> of, of, of participating in the Absolutely. campaigns. Take him up on that because I think he's doing great work. The organisation is doing great work. So get involved. And uh, I think that is the best way to celebrate Israel's... Uh Gentlemen, thank you for being with me on this uh, Revelation TV Presents as we mark and remember Israel's 70th anniversary as a nation reborn. So thank you for watching today's programme and uh, enjoy Yom Hatzmut, which is Israel's Independence Day as she reaches her 70th birthday.